Have you ever wondered what happens when entrepreneurship, environmental sustainability and venture capital collide? If so, you're like me and you're in the right place. Welcome to The Green Adventure. On the show, you'll learn from the critical insights of both founders and investors alike. Not random advice or generic guides, but real stories born out of their experience with genuine climate action. We aspire to create a network of people collaborating to build the green economy, accelerating us towards this critical target of net zero emissions. I'm your host and founder of the show, Jake Woodhouse. For all the notes, links and episodes, please visit www.greenadventure.com. Take care when typing that in. Adventure is spelt with a double D. Thank you for listening and enjoy the episode. On the show today, we speak with Ahmed Detta, founder of Advanced Sustainable Development, or ASD as it's otherwise known. ASD is transforming the recycling industry worldwide with an aim to improve how we recycle plastics, creating a transparent and sustainable circular economy. Listen to Ahmed's story and enjoy an honest appraisal of early failure. Learn how deep your research must be to uncover genuine long-term commercial prospects and how personal psychology plays a role in becoming an entrepreneur. Ahmed's vision of the future of recycling is a breath of fresh air. Enjoy, guys. Hi, Ahmed. Welcome on the show. Thank you for having me. No problem at all. To start today, please can you give us a snapshot summary of yourself and your current role? Sure. So I'm the founder and CEO of Advanced Sustainable Developments, and we are a PET recycling facility, but focusing on looking at consumer behavioral change to unite every stakeholder in the recycling journey. And what we're finding is that at the moment, the recycling industry is broken out into different components and no one's fully united and, and nobody has a full understanding. So what our business is, is focused on is, A, providing a solution to plastics recycling and predominantly PET recycling, which is the one we interact with mostly in our day-to-day, which is your food packaging material and liquid handling materials, so your water bottles. So we're looking at providing a complete solution with that, but also ensuring that that material actually gets recycled. And we've got a two-pronged approach with looking at consumer behavior and behavioral change, as well as actually having a processing facility to actually deliver on those commitments. Okay. Before you became the founder of this business, Ahmed, can we click rewind slightly and, sure. and look a little bit at the journey that you've been on to get to this point? Sure. We'll, we'll get into the details of the company itself later okay. in the interview. So I noticed on, on your LinkedIn you spent some time doing a sustainable business degree. Yes. I assume that was the CISL. That's right. Language. Yes. Awesome. I'm, you know, what's taking you through university into this point today? So I did my first degree in marketing at Lancaster and I actually didn't get the grade I needed to get, which kind of let me at 21 with a 2-2 face the world thinking I'm, all the graduate programs declined me. I had all the offers conditional on two on or above. And I basically, I was sat there thinking, I really want, really disappointed about not being able to enter the corporate world. So I ended up starting my career in sales and IT sales, selling Cisco systems. And whilst financially I was ahead of the curve of all of my friends, I bought my first house at 24, which is a big, you know, I looked at that big screw you to my friends who got into the graduate programs, the 2-1, and I was like, well, I'm financially, financially really successful. But I felt empty. But I was like, whilst I've earned this money, I don't feel good about it and also my parents have their own small they do a lot of community work and we've always kind of my parents have cooked food for the less privileged in our local community so I've always had that give back mindset and that was a real I was in a real you know dichotomy because on one side I was enjoying you know being a high flyer but at the same side I was like there's people really suffering where do I get a balance so it was the team the company I was working for they took us out on a sales incentive to Dubai and I fell in love with the place, and I was like, I really want to move out here. And it was there where I got headhunted to set up a mobile phone recycling company. And that's where the aha moment came for me, that actually I can feel good about profitability. And that's where my career started in recycling. So I started recycling mobile phones, taking my technology and IT sales experience, but also fulfilling that need to give back. So I, what we were looking at doing is we did some really great charity campaigns. So we work with the charity Operation Smile, where you recycle a phone, we'll give a child a smile for life. So each BlackBerry that we recycle, we had a deal with BlackBerry at the time, 
that that phone would pay for the cleft palate operation. So rather than you taking the £150 back, you would donate that directly to Operation Smile. And they would give a cleft palate operation for a child. So that was really, really empowering, that disused technology. It wasn't being thrown into landfill. It wasn't caused any further damage, yet it's going to impact somebody who really needs it. And the person who's facilitating that is you or I. So that was where my career started. And it was during, as that evolved, it started looking at IT recycling, and then everybody was like, what about my plastic? What about my paper? And it was at that point where I was getting further and further involved in the pressures of sustainability and understanding what sustainability is. And it's not just environmental, it's also political, it's economic, it's technological. And looking at how do you come up with a solution and what is a solution and how do I unite all of these people, you know, average Joe, through to, you know, a blue sky thinker. How is this actually going to achieve a united goal? So I decided to come back, and that's why I started my programme at Cambridge. And I started doing my research, and some of the high-level information that I realised was two of the most de facto materials in our day-to-day lives are, that won't change is rubber for tyres. You can see yeah, the most advanced cars like Tesla still having the same rubber tyre pushing a Ford Fiesta. And that's not, I can't see that changing, and a lot of studies have said that's not going to be changing. In the same way, PET, polyethylene threpylate, will be the de facto material for food packaging and food handling. Whilst biomaterials are out there, you've got where they're produced and how they're produced, you've still got the carbon impact. But also, most importantly, it's, it's all about a price point as well. It's going back to who's the consumer. Not everybody can demographically afford to buy organic or buy biodegradable. And that's a small fraction of a conscious society. The rest of us are unconscious. So I was sat there with all these issues and how do I get to a point where this is going to happen? And when I looked at PET, I was like, well, this is where, whilst we're not going to get away from it, we can change our relationship with it. And by changing our relationship with it, bringing in the right psychology, we can actually make a change. And that's where the idea was founded to look at doing a pet recycling facility where I was able to bring in every aspect of components of circular economy and put in a solution. So, and I, whilst I was out in Dubai, I, I did the feasibility for the first project in Abu Dhabi. And it was during then when I realized actually on a macro level that the UK were just as bad. But when I looked at the industry, the industry's got one mindset. You've got sustainability having one or a different agenda. And what you've got in the middle is the actual users of materials and products and everything else who, quite frankly, are quite confused. So I wanted to get away because I was equally confused. So what I wanted to do is put together a solution that provided a clear step-by-step journey on the entire product process, but then showing how environment, impact, your demographic and everything else can contribute. And it was these micro changes in behavior that will create a macro change ultimately for our environment. It was my own personal disconnection with capitalism that inspired me to actually look at sustainability a lot further, but also look at sustainability where I'm not a tree hugger. I'm not making big statements and claims. I'm actually, it's tangible sustainability where you can, as an individual, can see the difference that you're making. And that's true sustainability for me. Wow. I mean, what a brilliant opening answer to that question. Thank you. So many areas to, to touch on there that I think are awesome. In particular, the, the first moment leaving university. Mm. You know, oh, no, I haven't hit what I was <laughs> yeah. aiming for. And that, that's a failure, mm. straight up. Absolutely. And learning to get past that. And what I find so awesome about speaking to people and mm. talking about decision-making and about motivation. Mm. And so many things there that you touched on that I'd love to speak through in more detail sure. if we have more time. Sure. But in particular, I, I love what you're trying to do in terms of the sustainability picture. We know things are mm. bad, mm. but we still buy the cheapest thing. Mm. It's just human nature. Yes. And therefore, when trying to build businesses that are solving sustainability issues, mm. often it comes back to the price point. Absolutely. You cannot compete unless it is the same price as a fossil fuel-based mm. or status quo type product. Absolutely. And I think that's a fascinating thought process to have gone through. To move to the next step, I really want to understand the, the problem it is that you're specifically trying to solve with your current business. Sure. So, Amazing experience has brought you through to this point and lots of areas that you're putting together mm. being confused. Yeah. I'm confused all Absolutely. the time. You know? Should you choose a second-hand car or mm. a brand-new Tesla, sure. which has more impact? Absolutely. We, we don't actually know the answer to that. 
But yeah, can you perhaps talk us a little bit through then the, the specific problem you came across that you were trying to solve? So, yeah, so the specific problem is around plastics recycling and actually having a... I could not find a real solution for the problem. We've got so much negative press around plastics in the ocean, plastic being sent out to Malaysia and the Far East. And what I couldn't see was a clear journey of what actually happens to a bottle or a material that we utilise on a daily basis. And what I realised with technology recycling was it was so schizophrenic. You know, you look at your iPhone, you had the iPhone 5, which is quite slim and small and petite, and the iPhone 6 came out was, was you know, obese big brother. And therefore, that's a different technology component, different amount of material being used. How would you then recycle that? So the problem I wanted to resolve was, A, looking at a solution that solved a problem that's faced on a day-to-day basis, which is plastic, but also being able to look at a solution that will be implemented for the long term and not just being a fad, not just a phase. And that was the problem I had with electronics recycling, was I never knew what I was going to recycle. So therefore, it wouldn't always be commercially viable or we would have to then work with a multiple set of partners to try and recycle something and then there was no confidence that it actually fully got recycled so what I wanted to do was address a waste problem where there was a complete closed loop process and when I looked at sustainability sustainability for me is also about longevity what's going to be around for the long term because we have to preserve our environment and our systems for future generations and during my studies, when I realised that actually rubber for tyres and PET was going to be around for the long term, I said, right, I'm going to focus on this specific material because it's not going to change. The price points will always mean that it will be used, but also everybody's familiar with it. Um, people carry water bottles, people buy microwave meals, people buy you know, vegetables in, in plastic wrapping. So therefore, there's that resonation with the actual problem. And it was these different things that, it's a combination of problems that I was looking to resolve. But ultimately, what I wanted to do is have a solution that is going to be there for the next 15 to 20 years, not just a ride the wave and then say, okay, we're done now. And then... It's so exciting, I guess, as an entrepreneur, is when you know that market is going to be in existence you know, hmm. 10, 15 years from now. Absolutely. And you've got a fair amount of runway there to actually come up with a solution that does work and is hmm. managed. Absolutely. And also, when I looked at PET, PET resonates or it works with our basic human needs of food and water. And with populations increasing, you know, we're going to be, what, 8 billion people by 2050? There will always be that need. So therefore, having that long-term solution that, A, is in line with the macro statistics of economics was crucial, but it was the microeconomics that all would be united together, that would actually make that change. And it was, when I was looking at that, these were the problems. I saw several problems and I saw several solutions. And the one that was most legitimate was focusing on one material to begin with. And then ultimately we'd look at, you know, seven different types of plastic, we'd look at those forms. But right now it was looking at one solution for one specific problem, creating the momentum, creating that change which can then ultimately filter out into other forms. And that leads nicely on to talk about the solution. Mm. So perhaps you could explain a little bit about the product. Sure. So the product we're bringing is a recycled polymer, which polymers are, I guess, small plastic balls, which are then, we are creating what we call food-grade standard polymers or pellets. And these can be directly used back into making a bottle or food packaging material. So it has minimal chemical impact it's as pure as making product from oil so a manufacturers are very happy about that because they're not relying on fossil fuels to create the the plastic bottle but also they're getting a material that meets the hygiene standards to be able to handle food packaging so that's the end product that we are creating and we are in discussions with several major manufacturers who want to actually buy that for them because what they've done is they've committed to the public that their bottles and their food packaging will be from recycled sources. So we will be contributing to their sustainability mission as well. And so just for me to understand from a very simplistic perspective, Mm. outside there is a bin full of plastic bottles. Mm. What happens to them in order to become polymers? Sure. So typically what happens, if you're a user, you dispose of your bottle in a waste bin, that will traditionally be collected by a waste management company. The waste management company will separate that and then we will collect that from a waste management organisation. 
once it hits our facility, it goes through a washing line. So your bottle will get stripped of its label, its glue, its cap, and that will be separated. And there's a chemical process where all the PET plastic material will sink and all the remaining material will float in this washing line. Once that gets to the next stage, it gets washed, it gets grinded, and you end up with these flakes. Those flakes can be traditionally used for making cling film or plastic bags, but we're bypassing that because we want to put responsible plastic products back out in the market. And then that goes into an extruder. An extruder then heats that and creates the end pellet. The end pellet is then purchased by injection moulding firms that are contracted with the manufacturers, and it gets put into a preform which makes a bottle again, and it comes back out of the system. Awesome, Armin. And just to take a step back to when you were working over in the Middle East mm. and some of the, the first steps you took into mobile phone recycling, mm. and suddenly this is a solution that you've come up with after this journey of a bit of re-education and, mm. and clearly a huge amount of market research. Yes. And that leads me nicely to really talk about every entrepreneur has to make this step. Mm. You research the market, mm. but at some point you go, right, let's get in there. Mm. What was that leap of faith moment for you then in terms of like, oh my God, right, I've got to risk my career, my, my own money, or yeah. whatever it might be. So the leap of faith moment was when I came across the idea of plastics recycling and did the research and realised where it historically failed and where industry is now and why it's unlikely to fail. When I took it to my boss and he was like, you know, he almost did that little Britain computer says no type (laughs) scene and I was like, oh my God, you know, why are you so myopic to the opportunity? And it was at that point where I just thought, you know what, I've got to do this. I have to do this. So I decided that I then quit. And then I actually had a job offer um, to move back to a startup in a completely different industry in Amsterdam, which is a city I love. But then I decided to go out to Thailand for six weeks and do a Muay Thai boxing course. And it was there where I met an executive coach who does emotional freedom technique, which is EFT tapping, which basically changes the, your neurological path to your brain. And I was almost kind of frozen in my thinking that do I want to set up this business myself? I've quit my job, I've got that job offer to go to, or do I want to start this myself? But what was there was the fear. And the fear and the insecurity and, oh, God, will they take me seriously? And have you ever done this before, et cetera, et cetera. You know. But then at the same time, I've got the passion, I've got the motivation, it's, I've got the DNA makeup, you know, for sustainability, this all makes sense. So yeah, my mind was in a loggerhead again, but my heart was like, I've got to do this. So I used the six weeks of just executive coaching to eliminate my fears, my anxieties, and really, you know, my training, my physique. And, you know, my coach said, you know, your body is the vessel that carries your emotions. Get that right, and you will sail through your journey. And that's, it was the six weeks of really delving into every fear, insecurity, doubt, and just realizing that it's not reality. That's not my reality. And everybody psychologically is the same. We have a number of fears and doubts and insecurities, but 99.99 times they will never come true. And then it was that, that coaching period where I realized, actually, you know what, this is also a chemical process. This is cortisol going to my brain. If I now have to reduce that cortisol, I can think clearly. When I can think clearly, I know I can do things. And it was that change in my whole... It was shifting my decision-making from my head to my heart. And a lot of people were like, you're mad. But I said, at the end of the day, without breath, you can't live. And that's the truth of your reality. And I now went into a much more of a heart-centered approach to my work, which gave me the consistency and the stability and, most importantly, the tenacity to go through investor meetings. I went through three years of due diligence with a AAA-rated investor who interrogated everything. We sailed through it. Because my heart was like, this is what you want to do. You stay focused. Whereas my head was in all directions. It was a fair ground. You know, this was solid. So that was the journey I took on, you know, using executive coaching to just eliminate all of this noise. I love um, the word you've used there, the fair ground. I have to admit, I find myself often in the fair yeah, ground. So you know, the blue sky thinking, I do this, I do yeah. that. Oh, we could do that. And you just have to focus. Absolutely. On it was that focus. And that was also linked back to the actual practical aspect there were so many different technologies out there, you know, so much blue sky approaches. But I said, what's actually going to make a difference? What is someone who has no sustainability experience, who's not privileged to have education or anything else, understand these factors? And for me, it was focus, simplicity, and actual tangibility was they were kind of my, my core values. And Ahmed, taking those, let's say, higher-powered thought processes... Mm. 
you've got an idea, mm. you've taken the leap of faith, at some point you're going to speak to investors to mm. actually fund this process. Mm. But the process of gaining early traction, trying mm. to actually convert vision into traction. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about that and then we'll go on to talk a bit about that. Sure. So the early stages was really, it was all about mapping, taking everything out of my head and litmus testing with strangers friends or at somebody in my network who I can say, what do you think to this idea? And it was the feedback that I got which helped me then fine-tune the proposition ready for investors. So I almost did mock testing, mock presentations. I gave documents for people to review, to scrutinize. Yeah. Very, very grateful for my friends and even the executive coaches that I worked with said, we will review your documents. It was really a off-record. It was like a rehearsal, the same as I guess I would say, you know, um, a singer or actor, they did their they practice their lines, they practice their script, and then they went out on stage. But before they'd swear, they'd burp, they'd do everything else in the same way, you know, I'd, I'd misspell something or, you know, I, I got a logo wrong or, you know, the PowerPoint presentation looked like, you know, looked stupid or the colors made it look really, you know, unnecessary. So it was all these different testings that I did. The most important thing was taking it all out of my head and putting it on paper and writing it out. And that, for me, it was that transference of energy. So then it gave me more headspace. And then once I had the headspace, I was then able to then say to my friend, can you, what do you think of this presentation? You have no idea. You're a pharmacist. Does this make sense? And yes or no. If they said yes, then great. I'd then make it a bit more sophisticated because I'd be talking to a more sophisticated audience. But ultimately, it was, let me do, can, it, can anybody understand this? And if, if they can't, I'm talking at the wrong level. So that was like and, a preempt work. I, I couldn't agree more in terms of that early stage feedback and how important it is. You're on stage, mm. you're in front of an investor. Mm. I understand you work with the C tribe to, mm. to help raise some funds. Yes. What advice would you give to any listeners about the process of being a founder and going out there to speak to the investment market and how do you find the process? So I think the first thing as an investor is cut out time thieves and energy vampires at your network. I've cut out um, some close friends who, obviously, for for, uh, for Rome are nameless, but I thought they were the right type of friends for my bigger growth, but it wasn't. So it was quite a tough decision to say, who are my real friends? Who is my real network? Because you are going to have, as I said, the fairground. You're going to have peaks and troughs. And who's going to be there with you with the good times and who's going to be there with the bad times? So the first thing I advice I'd give to entrepreneurs is really be ruthless in who you surround yourself with, with the right, you know, people you can learn from, people who will lift you when you're down, and people who will be consistent no matter what part of the journey you're at. So that's the first thing I would say in terms of your own personal energy, because that's, I think, essential to becoming an entrepreneur is having the energy to um, which will give you the drive and tenacity. In terms of then going out for investment, I would firstly say keep it simple. Sea Tribe is fantastic because they have an array of different investors across the world. So therefore having a proposition that is crystal clear and simple. And I would say that also be extremely transparent at what, what stage you're at in the business. Everybody loves ambition, but ambition without a realistic and risk mitigated plan, no investor will take you seriously. They love the drive and ambition, but if you can't deliver on that, it's a waste of time. So I say to every entrepreneur, get involved with a project manager or a risk analyst. Their negativity will bring you to success and positivity. Temper the fairground. Sorry. Exactly, absolutely. <laughs> Your personal passion it shines through on it. It's very clear why you're doing what you're doing. Hmm. I'd love to understand a bit more about the actual potential impact. So, as we've touched on already, mm. rubber is going to be on a car, mm. regardless if it's a combustion engine mm. or electric. That's not even going into the conversation about whether or not we should be working on hydrogen cars sure. versus lithium-ion batteries, mm. but a conversation for another sure. day. The process of helping to create these polymers that you mm. mentioned, what kind of a carbon emissions impact would this have on our supply chain, or how do you measure it in terms of the metrics, and what are you looking at as a... Sure. So, in essence, one tonne of plastic waste or PET waste emits over four tonnes of carbon dioxide. So, for each tonne that we recycle, we reduce the carbon impact by four times. So, that's a very high-level metric. The other impacts are, obviously, the reduction on the reliance on fossil fuel. So, therefore, we're not extracting, we're not fracking, we're not, doing, we're not damaging the earth to, to get this to get the oil to make this material. But by strategically locating our facilities as well, 
and creating micro circular economies across certain parts of the country and, and globally, what you've got is a reduction of carbon emissions through transport as well. So a local manufacturer, we're, we're selling locally to locally based organisations. So, for example, a facility in, in the northwest. We are ideally trying to sell to businesses based there, so the truck journey is minimal as opposed to sending it from Manchester to South End. So, therefore, we've looked at impact on a number of things. And also, when we've looked at impact, we've looked at the design of the building. We've gone from modular build, which has a PVC roof, which does not require lighting in the day. So, therefore, the carbon impact of that building and the construction is reduced. I mean, PVC roof, it's as strong as the O2 arena. You don't realise that's a semi-permanent construction. And that's sort of the decisions we've made to look at the overall impact of our facility and looking at the carbon reduction side as many different ways as possible um, that realistic and realistically can be achieved. Outside of of the business impact of the facility and producing that product, we've also looked at impact and how consumers can make an impact and their contribution to that. So if you want, I can expand upon that in a bit more detail or cover it a bit later. Well, actually, we're a bit pushed for time. We're going to try and keep it to 30 minutes. So I love meeting founders that clearly have sustainability at the centre of everything Mm -hmm. because you wouldn't be able to toss a bat the factory, frankly, as long as it was coming at a price point with the product. Mm -hmm. Clearly, when you have a purpose so central, Mm -hmm. it actually filters down into every other part of the business. Yes. Yeah, so the next round, I just want to, well, this is the first time we've tried this. I'm calling okay. it the Sustainability Sprint Round. Okay. Essentially three questions, which right. I'd love you just to answer straight off the top sure. of your head. What is the coolest piece of clean tech you've recently used? Coolest piece of clean tech? It's a jolt thought. Mine would be an e-scooter recently when I visited Paris. So picking up one of the bird scooters on your, on your mm. mobile app and bombing around the town instead of using your... I think the, one of the coolest things was the um, it's the hydrogen to water um, filters. So creating, rather than having bottled water or any other form of water in the Middle East, they've got these hydrogen containers that use the humidity in the air and then get, get drinking water in the office. Oh, wow. So it, bringing the environment in and getting away from plastic use. So I thought that was a very, a very cool, tangible... The uh, hydrogen okay. technology space really moving as well. I mm. think the project in the uh, in shipping space where they'll take seawater right. and they'll actually create on demand hydrogen from the seawater and the emissions are, of course, uh, yeah. oxygen. Uh, particularly cool. The final one mm. is what is the most important alteration you may have taken in your own life from a sustainability perspective over and above the business you're trying to build? Making myself sustainable in all aspects of my life, um, eating clean, you know, taking time to have uh, mind space and making sure that I'm around for the long term. Um, So looking at what I eat, how I exercise, who I socialise with, all these things contribute to your own long-term sustainability. So I've kind of looked at my full assessment of my own life before and then translated that into my my work life. Awesome. Tell you what, let's take a step back. I can edit this a bit. I'll do the book question again. Okay. Just answering the book. So I just say, so go, so name your favourite book and why? I have... (laughs) If Can you, I? If you don't have one, it really doesn't matter. I'm one of these people I skim read so much, so I, That's right. I'm really bad at books. Sorry. Okay, so Ahmed, we're on to our last question now, <laughs> which I like to think of as the kind of fast forward round. Sure. Imagine the day is in 2030. Hmm. How do you think that things may have gone in your wildest dreams? If we're in 2030, in my wildest dreams, recycling is just an integral part of our behaviour. We don't have to talk about it. It is as normal as breathing. You recycle without thinking about it, and that will be my ideal position by 2030. And the solutions are there, and it's not even something we would talk about or raise. What an amazing idea to end on. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Jake. Thank you very much indeed. That was The Green Adventure. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, then please help us out by sharing this episode with your networks and rating us on the platform wherever you may listen in from. For any questions at all, We'd love to hear from you, so please reach out on social media or email. Whether you're wondering about a technical term that's been discussed, would like an intro to a guest from the show, or even perhaps feature yourselves, we're here to help. My Twitter handle is at Jake Woodhouse, spelled as it sounds, but drop the final E. My email, jake at greenadventure.com. Remember, that's ad spelt with two Ds. Finally, for the notes, links, and episodes that will be coming 
visit www.greenadventure.com. Remember, that's add with a double D. Until next time, we'll be back soon. Thank you and goodbye.